In the British Museum, behind a sheet of protective glass, sits a 1,600-year-old Roman cup. At first glance, it's beautiful, a cage of glass panels showing a myth of ancient Greece. But look again. In the room, it glows an opaque green. Hold a light inside it, and suddenly, it burns red. In that glass is an object so advanced, scientists for decades believed it was impossible to exist in the ancient world. It's a 1600-year-old artifact built with the same principles as modern nanotechnology, and a world mystery hidden in plain sight for more than a thousand years. This is the invention of the Lycurgus Cup. The Lycurgus Cup is no ordinary artifact. It is a diatretum, or a cage cup carved from a single thick blank of glass. The outer wall has been cut away with impossible precision, leaving a lattice of figures suspended in air, joined to the inner cup by the thinnest of bridges. One mistake in its making, and months of work would shatter. Across the surface, the Thracian king, Lycurgus, fights against the creeping vines, his punishment from the god Dionysus for daring to defy him. The scene is not painted. It is sculpted entirely in the glass. Every fold of fabric, every curve of the vine, every contorted limb is frozen on the glass canvas. But what is interesting is what happens when light meets it. In daylight, it's an opaque, lustrous green. But when light passes through it, the transformation is instant. Green gives way to a deep, blood-red glow, as if the glass itself were alive. Nothing else from Rome or from any ancient culture in history has ever behaved this way, and no other complete example is known to this day. For more than a century, it defied all explanation. Some historians blame the passing of time itself. Perhaps, they said, the strange beauty was an accident, maybe by the weathering or mineral reaction no craftsman could have ever intended. But the more the cup was examined, the more impossible it became. Like clockwork, the cup would turn green in reflected light, and red in transmitted light, the change instantaneous, complete, and uniform across the entire surface. Decades passed without an answer. Theories rose and fell. Painted surfaces, fused layers, impurities in the sand, none of these theories turned out to be true. Until the year 1990. By that year, the Lycurgus Cup had been in the British Museum for more than 30 years. It had been studied, photographed, and even x-rayed. But the reason for its transformation from green to red remained an open question. Shortly after, researchers from the University of College London and the British Museum's own scientific department were given permission to take a closer look. They couldn't cut into the cup, of course. No responsible curator would ever allow that. The only material available for testing came from microscopic shards, no more than a millimeter across, which had broken away from the rim and base long before the investigation. These fragments were then placed under a transmission electron microscope, a scientific instrument capable of magnifying an object up to one million times. At that scale, the surface of a grain of sand looks like a mountain range, and even atoms can be made visible. What they ended up seeing in this microscope changed their entire understanding of the Lycurgus Cup. Embedded evenly through the glass were metallic nanoparticles, tiny spheres of gold and silver, each between 50 and 100 nanometers in diameter. For context, a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. A human red blood cell is about 7,000 nanometers across, and a strand of hair is over 100,000 nanometers thick. These particles were so small that no optical microscope could have ever revealed them. The glass also contained both metals in precise ratio, about 70% silver and 30% gold in weight. This proportion was critical. Too much silver and the glass would remain green under all lighting conditions. Too much gold and it would shift towards purple. The Lycurgus Cup, specific alloy, produced the exact state needed for its two-tone effect. This phenomenon known today is the concept of localized surface plasmon resonance. When light strikes a metallic nanoparticle, the free electrons on its surface begin to oscillate in a rhythm with the incoming electromagnetic wave. The size, shape, and composition of the particle determine which wavelengths are absorbed and which are scattered. In reflected light, when light bounces off the surface towards the viewer, the nanoparticles in the Lycurgus cup scatter the shorter wavelengths, such as blue and green, making the object appear an opaque greenish color. 
and transmitted light, those shorter wavelengths are absorbed instead, allowing longer red wavelengths to dominate. The resulting is a vivid crimson glow that made the cup so famous. This innovation brings us to the most surprising connection. This same principle, metallic nanoparticles altering light, now powers dichroic filters in satellites, space telescopes, and even astronaut visors. NASA engineers use it to control glare, filter wavelengths, and protect sensors from harmful radiation. The Romans, whether by brilliant design or astonishing accident, had created a piece of optical technology that could not be matched or recognized as such for more than a millennium. How Roman artisans achieved this still remains uncertain. They may have stumbled this effect on accident, perhaps while recycling glass mixed with finely ground metal dust from decorative work. Or they might have known enough to deliberately control the process, passing down the technique orally within elite workshops. Whatever the case, the level of precision is staggering. Even modern engineers struggle to evenly distribute nanoparticles through solid material. The Romans, it seems, had found a way. So, the mystery was solved. But the answer raised a new question. If it wasn't that useful, why build it in the first place? To understand why the Lycurgus cup was made, we have to think like the patron who commissioned it. In the late Roman Empire, art was never neutral. It was a currency, political, social, and cultural, traded right in front of the eyes. In many events, banquets were the stage. There would be hosts and actors. But unlike other banquets, this time there's one more piece that wins over the audience. The Lycurgus Cup. The showpiece, engineered for a single moment of revelation. When the light changed and green became red, the display became more than beautiful. It was unexplainable, like something divine. We can infer that the myth was also chosen with precision. Like Hera's downfall at the hands of the god Bacchus, or the Greek god Dionysus, was a warning to enemies. A reminder that resistance to a legitimate power, whether divine or imperial, ends in submission. In the charged political climate of the early 4th century, when emperors rose and fell through civil war, that symbolism carried much weight. And here's the kicker. There was barely any gold or silver in it, far less than a gram's worth in total. The material cost was almost trivial, but the skill required to disperse those particles evenly, to carve the cage without breakage, to fuse the narrative and optics into a single seamless object, that was beyond value. The worth of the Lycurgus cup lay not in what it was made of, but in the fact that no one else could make it. And that is why you make the Lycurgus cup. Not to drink from it, not even to own it, but to be the one who shows it. The Lycurgus cup is proof that ancients could see farther than we think. 1600 years ago, Roman hands mastered a technology we only named in the last century. They used it not to build machines, but to tell a story, to send a message, and to command a room. Today, it remains in the British Museum, a singular object that bridges the myth, craftsmanship, and science. A reminder that innovation is not solely about the modern times, and that sometimes, history leaves us with one example and no instructions. <laughs>